Merry Christmas. You know, there's something about Midnight Mass, isn't there? You know, it's, um, I guarantee you this, unless someone fires me, we will always have Midnight Mass. And we will not have fake Midnight Mass. Midnight Mass starts at 0000, okay? It doesn't start at 10 o'clock at night, because that's 10 o'clock Mass, okay? So there's something special about Midnight Mass. And I think it starts with, you've already had a wonderful Christmas Eve dinner. You've already had the great companionship of each other, a family, perhaps the beginnings of some families. I wonder if there's a newly engaged couple out there any place. Well, I won't make them show themselves, but you never know kind of thing happens on New Year's Eve. My big little brother, I say that because he's much bigger than me, but he's four years younger, he got engaged on Christmas Eve. It's a, it's a great evening to get engaged. But the majesty of Christmas kind of wraps itself around us, especially on Christmas Eve. But here at St. Peter's, we got off to an early start, didn't we? Wednesday night, the spirit of Christmas showed up here right out there in our parking lot. Thousands of lights turned on and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people showed up. And who were these people? I think that's the really cool part. They were a lot of our young people, our children and our young couples, sometimes who don't find their way to mass on Sundays on a regular basis, and there they were. And our old people, they were there too, braving 14 degree weather. As one of the 60 year old representatives, I can tell you, it was 14 degrees out, and next year I'm bringing all my ski equipment. And I mean all my ski equipment, including some real boots. I was saying to Father Muir earlier today, I will never ever wear Johnson and Murphy's to the, uh, to the Christmas lighting extravaganza ever again. And yet, notwithstanding the cold, the ice cold, there was great fun. And there was great celebration and real unity. The parish was one with the community. And there were a lot of faces we never see because they weren't even Catholic faces. They were faces of citizens of this city who came here because they heard it was a friendly place to visit and there was fun to be had that evening. And the Christmas spirit caught them too. But I'm going to tell you the story of how the Christmas spirit caught me that night. You see, unbeknownst to many of you, I took off my Santa hat for a couple minutes and I made my way through the door over here and I came in to thank the boss. To thank the boss for having this thing not fall on its backside and turn out pretty okay. And so I came in and the church was completely empty and completely dark except for all of the beautiful Christmas lights which were on. And it was just Christ and me. And you know, I could hear the Christmas music coming through our beautiful stained glass windows. And the spirit of Christmas was encircling God's house. And as I was praying and thanking the Lord, giving him my gratefulness, I think I heard just a little bit of a giggle. A giggle that was very much like the giggles we heard from the invincible innocence of our little people out there waiting for Santa to come in on a 1920-something vintage fire truck. It was the giggle, the laugh of a happy God whose people had gathered to him, whose people had united. That, ladies and gentlemen, is Christmas. Christmas 
is about hope. You see, if there's no Christ child, if there's no manger, if there's no angels bringing glad tidings of great joy to the simplest of men, the shepherds, then there's no hope for you and I. And life has very, very little meaning. The majesty of Christmas is about that message of hope. The majesty of Christmas is about you and I knowing that warts and all, we've got a really good shot at eternal salvation. But you know, a funny thing happens. I've celebrated Christmas all over the world. I've celebrated in good places and in bad. But it's funny. On Christmas night, everyone is filled with hope. Everyone. They go to midnight mass. You hear, oh, come all ye faithful. And, you know, before tonight, I don't think I ever heard that much singing in St. Peter's Church. And why is that? Roman Catholics are like Michigan football fans. We sit on our hands. Because we know we're in the original church. We're original club members. We don't need to sing loud. And yet, and yet, at Christmas time, we feel the need to do just that. It's in our DNA. Oh, come all ye faithful. It's like when they roll us out of the maternity section of the hospital, somehow we already know the first two stanzas of O Come All Ye Faithful. And by the time we're a year old, we definitely know O Come All Ye Faithful. And we're waiting for it. We wait for it all year. And when we hear it, there's joy in our hearts and souls. There's hope. There's aspiration. God is real. God is among us. Emmanuel, God among us. He is here. Things aren't so bad. Things are looking up. And then we do something really, really, really stupid. We do it every year. Kind of like lemmings going off a cliff together. We let Christmas slip away. We let it slip away just like FM 100.3 stops Christmas music at exactly midnight tomorrow night. Not 12.01, not 12.05, midnight. And then some nonsensical garbage comes on and I hit my classical music station channel again. Why is this? Why do we let Christmas slip away from us? Well, first off, as you all know, I know you know this. I could, I could hand a quiz out right now and you would know this, especially those who went to St. Mary's School, that Christmas does not end at midnight on Christmas Day. We go into the octave of Christmas and we go all the way in the Christmas season, all the way into the Christmas season, until the baptism of the Lord. So all those thousands of Christmas lights that are now enlightening Mount Clemens and bringing the message of the angels to Mount Clemens, they're staying on like rock stars until the baptism of the Lord. Because it's Christmas. But you and I, we let it slip away. This past week, we see things wonderful in the season of Christmas. You'll go into a Starbucks, and suddenly one wonderful guy or gal will say, I want to pay for the next four cars. You ever seen that happen? It's really cool. And then the next week, the same guy who paid for the four cars behind him develops atrophy with one of the fingers on his hands while he's driving, sending signals out to people. And we have to wonder why that happens the first week of January, when he was buying coffee for everyone the day before Christmas. Where does it go? What happens to the magic of Christmas? And why do we let it go? Why do we let the hope, the promise, the joy of Christmas slip through our fingers? A few minutes ago, we saw 
a beautiful second grader, gorgeous young lady, bringing up the Christ child to put in the creche. The hope for the future. Young Sophia, who's going to make her first confession this year and receive First Holy Communion, is here at Midnight Mass and had the honor and great duty to bring Jesus into his manger. I have an idea for all of us. Let's all become Sophia's teachers. Let's all send the message to her that 20 years from now, 25 years from now, maybe with a little Sophia of her own, she'll walk into this church at midnight mass and will have shared with her daughter or her son and certainly with her husband-to-be the message of the newborn Christ child, the message of hope, the message of mercy, the message of compassion, the message of kindness, the message of making the world a better place. Because, my friends, our world is in great trouble. We're incredibly divided. We're at each other's throats. We're vicious sometimes. Where's the mercy of the Christ child? Where's the compassion of the Christ child? Where's the hope of the Christ child? So this Christmas, we have to think differently. This Christmas, we have to extend the season so that it lasts all year long. Because our alternatives are striking. As some of you know, I'm kind of a big Christmas Carol fan. I think Dickens' work really, really sums up Christmas. And I'm reminded of the ominous story of the ghost of Christmas present. He's about to disappear on Scrooge. And before he does, he opens his robes. And there stands two children, both of them freezing, both of them dirty, both of them in great need. The first is a little girl called Want. And the second is a little boy called Ignorance. And the ghost tells Scrooge, And he's really telling us, beware the girl, for she is want. But beware more the boy, for he is ignorance. He is ignorance. And his success spells doom. And I think that's right. If we do not send the message of the Christ child to the little Sophias and have them spread it to their children, the message of the Savior will be lost and we will have failed. Jesus Christ is the Savior of the universe. He's our only hope. And we have to grasp the great miracle of Christmas. I think one of the reasons we have trouble grasping with it is because it's so incredible, it's hard for the human mind to put its hands around and say, this really happened. Think of it for just a second. God the Father sent his only son. Of him, we say this in the creed, of his substance, one with the Father. God from God, light from light. And he sent him, the God-man, to be among us. And the God-man was our only hope and salvation. And what did we do to him? We killed him. The little infant doesn't stay the little infant. The little infant grows up. And he's executed. And his message from his place of execution is, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I think he says that all the time to his dad. Every time a war breaks out, every time bigotry prevails, every time we hate each other as Americans, 
based on some stupid issue like politics. He says, Father, forgive them, for they know not know they know not what they do. But nonetheless, he saved us. And nonetheless, he gave us the resurrection. And by doing so, he gave us an opportunity for eternal salvation. God just can't stop giving to us. Can't we start giving to each other? Finally, I'll end with another Christmas movie analogy. The other night I was watching the only one of the three Santa Clauses brought to you by Disney that are worth watching. The first movie. The second and third movies are classic examples of, oh boy, can we make more money, let's do it now. But in the first movie, there's a son, Tim Allen's son, says something very poignant that I think all of us need to remember. Seeing isn't believing. Believing is seeing. When you accept Christ into your heart, when you let the Christ child penetrate that rough exterior, when you let him right in there, when you let him start operating at full speed inside of you, when you become his true extension, when you become the hands, the eyes, the ears, the giving hands of Jesus the Christ, your life is changed forever. But you have to know that believing is seeing. He's come for us. He's here. Welcome him in every aspect of your life and most importantly, into your hearts. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.